Preparing to delve in three, two, one. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Delve. My name is Nathan. And I'm Alex. And, uh, Alex, what is your favorite kind of king? Uh, mm, not the kind that beheads me. Uh, so really no king? Yeah, especially not French kings. Uh, right. I'm just thinking any kind of king that you come across is probably going to want to lop that bad boy off. I like the, the king of hearts, because he's already stabbing himself in the skull. And married to the Queen of Hearts, and boy, does that really smart. Um, so, uh, today on the show, however, uh, we, we are not talking about kings that want to lob off Alex's head, because we'd be here all day. Um, we are actually here to talk about Heirs of the Wizard King, uh, which is uh, going to be going to Kickstarter very shortly. Uh, and to talk with us about it today is creator of the game, Jonathan Politis. I hope I'm saying that right. It's actually Politis, but don't worry about it. Politis, Politis, I'm going to go with your spelling, or your pronunciation, because you said it. Okay, Jonathan Politis. I got it now. Yeah. There's, there's your edit point. There's my edit point. Perfect. Um, except for the YouTube. Then they're just going to have to deal with it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but that's okay. No one watches the YouTube, except for the three people that are currently listening to this on YouTube. Um, but uh, Jonathan... Uh, I, I I looked at Heirs of the Wizard King, and I am I am really happy. And the reason I'm happy is because we talk to a lot of people who do role playing games, um, and this is kind of like a nice breath of fresh air. It is a card game, um, and uh, and and it kind of makes me remember my fond days of playing uh, like competitive card games. Uh, can you tell me a little bit about how the game plays? What the game is? Uh, sure. So the idea is that the Wizard King has selected you and the other players to be his heirs. He's going to teach you everything he knows, and then he's going to pick the best one of you to be the next king. Before he can start, a black wizard comes along, kills the Wizard King, and starts an evil ritual that's going to destroy everybody. So players have to work together to stop the black wizard, but at the same time, only one person can be king. So you're racing and competing to try and have that be you. Ah, okay. So you you all have the same basic goal, but there can only be one, kind of like Highlander. Yeah, kind of like that. <laughs> it's okay. Highlander the card game, but with the magic. <laughs> yeah. I don't know I'd go quite that far. <laughs> That's okay. Um, so, uh, like, when I think about card games, at least for myself, the the one that I'm really familiar with is, like, Magic the Gathering. I, th I think that's kind of what most people think of. Is it similar to that in structure? Um, no, I wouldn't say. It's more of a set collection game, really, than a, you know, life point, you know, degradation kind of game. Mm -hmm. um, and it's also a little bit different because it's not a deck builder. There's just a single deck of 48 cards the players are all drawing from and using collectively. However, the abilities from Magic the Gathering, the fact that you, know, you have to do things like draw six cards and put four back, you know, those are things that really resonate with Magic the Gathering players. Okay, excellent. Uh, from what I can see, uh, it looks like the, the game is pretty quick. I mean, one to four players and 30 minutes. Um, is the 30-minute time frame for four players, or is that more like a, a two-player game? It's actually um, 30 minutes across all player counts, both one, two, three, and four. Oh. Um, yeah, the way I've been able to do that is I changed the goal. So in a two-player game, you're trying to reach the seven on a score track. In a three-player game, you're trying to reach the six. In a four-player game, you're trying to reach the five. So it stays pretty close to the 30 minutes, no matter the player count. Oh, okay. Great. Uh, I was also uh, talking about this just just a moment ago. The idea that you actually do have a a single player mode, which is so uncommon uh, in really any kind of tabletop game. Uh, why did you want to develop that? Well, to be honest, uh, about a month and a half ago, two months, I started reaching out to different reviewers, and one of the reviewers that I reached out to was Rado, um, and you know Richard Ham. Uh, and, you know, he said he didn't want to play the game just because, you know, it's a kind of a take that game. There are some take that elements. And so I started racking my brain about how I could make it appeal to Richard Ham. 
And what I came up with was, well, if you're playing by yourself, then there's no take that because there's no one else to take that with. So I started working on a solo mode and he's actually agreed to take a copy of the game and I just sent it off the other day. Oh, beautiful. It's- beautiful. Um, yeah, I mean, that's right up my alley because as Alex knows, I never have anyone to play games with. You have nobody at all to play games with. Sad emoji. Ever. Except for me, once in a while. Once in a great while. It's fun when we do, but uh, but then again, he, he has to ruin it. Um, now, now I, I see that everything is color-coded. Do, uh, are, are there specific powers that each, uh, each, each color has? Um, yeah, so in the game, there are six abilities, you know, one for each color, the rainbow, red, orange, yellow, green, blue, violet. And the idea is that inside each of those colors, the different wizards are more or less powerful. So you'll have, for instance, a red one, you know, does the red spell, but he only does it at a level one. And then there's the red seven, which does the same red spell, but he does it to, at the level seven. So they affect different amounts of cards. Oh, okay. How many different colors are there? there I, I'm uh, guessing four. You said uh, in, there's one for each six. color of the rainbow, so... Oh. Yeah. Yeah, I left off indigo, so there's six. Because indigo is just a shade of blue? Yeah, basically. <laughs> and, and at a certain point, you don't want too many blues in there, or it does look depressed. Sure. Yeah. Uh, Although the blue I've... we picked is kind of a happy blue, so... It's a nice-looking blue. It's kind of like a, a sunshiny blue. Kind of yeah. like that. Um, so uh, so now that's interesting. But now with, like, six colors, uh, you can't do a six-player game, I bet. Uh, no, it's... Uh, well, it would be really difficult because um, the Black Wizard, as he's trying to, you know, win the game and force everyone else to lose... Um, one of the ways that he gains points is every time the deck runs out, he gains a point. So if you have too many players, the deck runs out really quickly, and it just doesn't make it very fun. So the only way to have a higher player count is if you have more than one deck, you can combine them and play with up to eight at that point. But it does become a slightly different game. I see. Okay. So so really, the reason why you have six colors, but it's not a six-player game, is simply because it would basically be impossible. <laughs> Yeah, you got it. Okay, <laughs> that's good. How? Uh, why did you want to create this game? Well, so I've been playing games for just about ever, I'd say. Um, and I was in college, and you know, I was, you know, I had work and I had school, but I didn't have anything fun in my life. So, well, besides my my wife, don't let her <laughs> hear me say that. Um, but anyways, we were driving around somewhere, and I was just talking about how I'm kind of bored, and she's like, "Well, why don't you just make a game?" And I look at her, I'm just like, why don't I make a game? And so I just started, you know, designing games. And the first two or three were really, really terrible. But, you know, this one came along and it just kind of, you know, have you ever had those ideas where, you know, everything comes together at the same moment and you can just hit the ground running and everything works together? I wish. Uh, the podcast. <laughs> sure, we'll go with that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Um, but anyways, it was just one of those moments and everything just kind of came together and, you know, I've been able to, you know, have a really good first prototype, which is rare for the other games that I designed. So excellent. Anyways, Ex- yeah. Yeah. No, no, that's 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 great. Um, now, you did mention and I, I do have to ask about it, that you had a couple games that did not really gel together. And because I'm always interested in the process, can you tell me what you were trying to make with the uh, with the first couple that that didn't uh, didn't really gel for you? Um, sure. So the first couple really, um, I had mechanics, but then I could never get a theme that worked with it. Or I had a theme, but I could never get mechanics that worked with it. Um, the first one was you know a game where you're trying to be an evil genius and you're trying to collect the parts you needed to. Um, do your evil deeds and it just never quite clicked as it didn't have the mechanics to back it up Um, and then the second game was more of an rpg game and the theme was really rich Um, i'm sorry the mechanics were were rich but i just could never find a theme that was you know fitting to it so neither one of those projects really had both mechanics and theme necessary to stand on their own Uh, so okay yeah 
So, uh, so it's sort of like the three little bears. It's yeah. like one, one was too hot and one was too cold. One had the one had your mechanics, one had your theme, but the two. Yeah. I feel like the one was missing the body parts required to make the game work. Like one of the spirit, one of the the body kind of thing. Yeah. Well, I mean, yeah. since you're an evil scientist or mad scientist, I mean, you need extra body parts. Oh, <laughs> sure. I didn't have any. I didn't have any Frankensteining going on. I should have. That would have fixed. Maybe that would have fixed it. Yeah. If they hadn't given you that abnormal brain, you would have been all set. <laughs> Abby normal. That's gonna be. That can be. Uh, that can be one of your players. Don't yeah. make that one of your players. That would be a bad idea. Do not play with Abby Normal. Um, <laughs> you are now Abby Normal. So uh, I was curious about um, the players in your game. Uh, do they play different characters, or do you just play from the deck? Uh, yeah, so it's a, a symmetric game. Everyone represents just an heir, and everyone starts the game without knowing any of the abilities or able to do them. So you're just playing off the deck. Um, but the thing that's cool about the game is as you play, you're able to learn spells. There's a little um, magical tech tree that you can advance on. And so through the course of the game, everyone will be end up playing vastly different characters because they'll have different spells that they have advanced along this tech tree. Nice. So magic is technology now. Well, just, I mean, I could say magic tree, but people would get confused. It's the tree of life. Just call it you drasseled. Yeah. And people people just be like, what? Yeah. Was was that everything you had to say? <laughs> <laughs> uh yeah, that's everything I had at least as far as that question goes. Oh, I, I didn't mean you. I meant Alex. Oh. He he got on the Yggdrasil thing and I wasn't sure if that was like the end of his thought process or not. <laughs> My but, thoughts have zero processes. You should know this by now. Yeah, I'm fully aware. So, um, Jonathan, the uh the the Kickstarter is going to be starting fairly soon. I'm I think. Uh, yeah, it's going to launch September fifth, so just a little bit more than five days. Ah, yes, coming right on up. Is that going to go for? Uh, is that a full month? Uh, it's going to go from September fifth to October seventh, so a little bit more than a month. Okay, Even better, more time to make all the people want to play your game. Yeah. <laughs> Just a little extra time in the oven. Um, yeah. But now you're you're pretty familiar with Kickstarter. You follow Kickstarters uh, very intently. Uh, yeah, I do. Um, so I started backing Kickstarter games about three years ago. And from that point till now, I've backed over 50 games. Wow. Um, and part of the reason I'm able to do that is I've convinced my wife that it's all in the name of research for <laughs> designing games. Fair enough. Um, yeah, so once a week, generally on like a Saturday, I go through and I just scan all of the games that are almost over. So that way I can see whether they're already funded and I can go through and see what they did right, what they did wrong. And then every once in a while I'll be like, oh man, that, that game is amazing. I have to back that game. So... It works out for me. In that uh, process, when, when you say you backed 50 games, were they all 50 successful Kickstarters? Uh, yeah, so I make a, uh, I have backed about eight or 10 unsuccessful games, but I tend to only back games that are already successful. That's just, right. you know, I don't like getting my hopes up for something and then having the campaign fall apart. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I, I can understand that. Um, since you are familiar with seeing that process, did you notice that like once uh, they had hit their goal and you knew that it was funded, was there a lot more in terms of what people suddenly were able to contribute for the very same reason that you uh, would jump in? Yeah, I mean, that's one of the things that Kickstarter has always you know, had, where if the game isn't at its funding goal, People are a lot more reluctant to back it because they don't want to get their hopes up. They don't want to, you know, there's this concept of like imaginary money. Like when you back, I'm giving imaginary money to them. It's I don't want to spend imaginary money on something that doesn't actually, you know, that's not actually going to exist. So mm -hmm. most people like 
they back a game when they're confident that it's going to reach its goal, that it's going to be successful, um, whether that's because they've been hearing all this hype and so they want to back it immediately or whether it's already reached its funding goal and they know that their money is going to go to a good place. Right. What, um, what draws your attention to a Kickstarter when you're thinking about backing it? Um, well, generally, I look at you know a handful of things. Um, I generally try and look at the project image. You know, it's got to have some good information just right from the get go. It has to have a catching name. You know, I check out the the graphics, the art, and then I go through and I try and find the mechanics because I think everyone who's backed Kickstarter games has backed games that they haven't actually enjoyed once they arrived. So yeah. I really try and make sure that the mechanics are there, the theme is there, that I feel like I'm going to enjoy playing this game. And then probably the last thing I look at is the price of it, whether I feel like you know, the price to what I'm getting is a good balance, or if I feel like I'll be vastly over or underpaying. I see. see that, that's what I look at first, because I go, can I afford this right now? Huh. And if so, I will do it if I have the money and want the game. Got it. So I uh, I don't back that many Kickstarters because I don't have a lot of money. <laughs> okay. He really well, does. I mean, I heard about this really good game coming up. Um, it's called Heirs of the Wizard King. Hey. Yeah. Oh, really? I yeah, I think it's launching on Monday, and it's pretty affordable. It's only 19 and it includes shipping. So that's See, nice. that is that is a very low cost barrier yeah. to entry, and that is actually something that people go, wow. This looks good. I can afford that, if, even yeah. if they're spending imaginary money. Yeah, you got it. This is uh, this is very much true, and uh, and they can see all of the mechanics there too. So that's good. Yeah, just like you did. Have mm -hmm. you um, now? Speaking of that, though, have you ever uh, backed any projects and then you get the game and it's not quite what you imagined it was going to be? Um, yeah, I've gotten a couple. Um... I mean, I, I'd rather not name names because, you know, right. I, I still like the people who made the games. Um, but there have been a handful that, you know, I, I was really excited for it. It shows up and I'm just like, man, either the art's really cool or the concept's really cool. But I start, you know, reading through the rules and the rules don't really click for me. And I start trying to play the game and it just doesn't come across fun. I'm not enjoying myself. And I have lots of games, so I'd rather you know, play the ones that I enjoy than the ones that I don't. Do you find yourself in the cases like that when you're finding a game that you thought sounded cool and then it just doesn't play the way you think? Do you find yourself taking the game apart and being like, well, if they had done it this way, it'd be way more fun? Um, it, actually, yes. Um, there was one game in particular, uh, I will mention this one, it's called Little Drop of Poison. It was, I think... Last year, September sometime. Um, but the thing that was, uh, when I was looking at the game, it's just this little, it's a you know, bunch of cards in a tuck box, and the idea is that you are all represent rodents, either weasels or rats, and you're trying to kill the other type of rodent in order to get points. And it's an elimination game, and you, know, you play a number of rounds, whoever has the most points after a number of rounds, you, you win. And the interesting thing was that I remember looking at the Kickstarter thinking, oh, man, elimination, like, I don't want to play another elimination game. Like, no one really, most people tend to shy away from those. And then I was looking at the mechanics, I'm like, you know, this would be really cool if it wasn't an elimination game. And so by the time it had come, I had worked out all the rules so that, you know, you don't get eliminated. If you die, you just get a new rodent, you just keep playing. But, you know, that's one game that I ended up just, taking apart, you know, and putting it back together the way that I wanted it. <laughs> you house rolled it to where it yeah. was fun for you. <laughs> yeah. You told your wife, look at all this research I just did. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm, I mean, that's one of the things that uh, game designers will tell you is, you know, if you want to design a game, you know, the first thing you should do is find a game that you already like or one that you don't like and make it better. You know, take mm -hmm. it apart, put it back together whatever you need to do to make it a better version. And that's how you can learn to be a, to be a uh, game creator, a designer. It makes sense. Yes. And yes. It's it a lot does. easier than coming up with your own game. Yeah. 
<laughs> yeah, that's that's the lesson we take away from it. How Don't much... make your own games. Just tear someone else's apart. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Did I mean, that? You... Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Oh, I, I was just gonna say, did that prime you for when you actually started building your own game? Um, it actually did. So the um, the game I mentioned, it uh, I got the game in like June of last year. Um, I misspoke. I, I just looked it up. Um, but the Heirs of the Wizard King, that idea came to me um, August last year. And because I had taken apart, you know, this other game and put it back together, you know, I, it actually gave me a couple of the ideas that I've used in Heirs of the Wizard King, where you're all trying, because in uh, uh, Little Drop of Poison, there's, uh, there is a, a king, either a king weasel or a king rat. And you're, you're trying to work together to stop him, but in the end, only one person can win. And that mechanic where you know, you're tr- working together, but you're also fighting each other, um, th- that was actually one of the things that I took from Little Drop of Poison. Oh, I see. Okay. When you're looking at games on Kickstarter, are there certain types of games that you prefer, like card games, role-playing games, board games, something like that? Um, I tend to feel like I have a, a pretty wide um, taste when it comes to games, but I, I would say that I tend to um, live more on the Ameritrash side than the Euro side. Mm. Um, I, you know, I, I, do, I still like you know, Euro games, but there's only like two or three hardcore Euros that I really enjoy. Mm-hmm. But most of the games that I like are, you know, somewhere in the, the hybrid between the two or more on the Ameritrash side. But as gotcha. far as like card games or, you know, mini games or whatever, I don't really have a preference. Just whatever looks good and it seems to have good mechanics. I see. Okay. Um, when, like, you're, you're starting your own Kickstarter for, for Heirs of the Wizard King. What lessons have you taken away from uh, Kickstarters that maybe weren't successful that you have been able to learn from for your own campaign? Um, sure. Um, so one thing that uh, I've seen you know, time and time again is people come onto Kickstarter and they have everything priced out. You know, They have all the mechanics, the artwork, whatever. But then you actually look at their goal and it's like, two or three or ten times what it should be. Like, it's a little card game, and each game is like $10, but their goal is like 30000 And, you know, you just have to, like, ask yourself, like, there's no way that they actually need that much money to make this game, you know. Um, so that'd be one lesson that I've learned. The other one is just uh, you have to have your project 95% done, like, There's a lot of people who put things on a Kickstarter and all they have is, well, I got a name and I got an idea and I have some sketches that my, my, my kid drew. Mm -hmm. That's great. It will be good someday. So you just, you have to put in a lot more work. (laughs) Right. Um, I mean, I th- I feel like we've talked to some people, not necessarily on the show, but we've talked to some people that we actually know who are like, I just want to put up a, a Kickstarter or a Patreon. And it's like, okay, well, what are you going to be able to show them? I don't know. Well, <laughs> that's kind of problematic. <laughs> you, yeah. You have to be able to show them something. Yeah, I mean, there's, there's a reason that half, roughly half, <laughs> of the games on Kickstarter fail. People just mm-hmm. don't have fully fledged ideas. But then the projects that fail, if they work on it and bring it back again, Repeat projects are way more likely to succeed than first-time projects. Yeah. You think that that's just, uh, like, the learning curve? Like, a lot of people just don't know how to do it when they start? Uh, definitely. I mean, the learning curve, you have to start it well before you, you run your Kickstarter. Um, there are a handful of projects that have succeeded. Like, they reached their funding goal, but then because they underestimated the time or the effort, it's just taken years longer or more money than the game is worth to actually produce. Right. So you have to learn the lessons before. You have to do your research. You have to check out like James Matthews' blog or Jamie Stegmeier's blog. Like you have to go through and do the research, do the work in order to have a game that's you know, 
worth backing and once backed will be successful in delivering right right uh i mean for me uh like i, I every time uh I think, boy, it'd be cool to have a Kickstarter if I had something to kickstart. I kept thinking it, it feels like herding really erratic cats <laughs> on, a, on a daily basis. And I don't know if I have the patience for it. Uh, and, and everyone that I've talked to who has done a Kickstarter pretty much just nodded and said, yep, that's pretty much what it's like. Um, yeah. are, are you ready for the cat herding uh, that is going to uh, befall upon you. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, let's put it this way. I hope so. I really yeah. hope so. <laughs> it's a good problem to have. It not say. <laughs> oh, definitely. I mean, I would rather be a ki- be a guy with a hundred cats that I need to herd and get to a goal than a guy with no cats. I mean, cats are really fun. Oh yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Uh, be be, be a, a crazy cat lady. And just have a yeah. hundred cats. I mean, it's it's better than being alone. Oh wait, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that I own the cats or that's <laughs> mine. I'm just saying that I'm herding the cats, you giving know? them where they need to go. That's that's oh, all I'm saying. Oh, you were hired by the crazy yeah. cat lady to get the you cats. Got it. Okay, you and got bring it. it back. Okay, that's right. Yeah. That that yeah. actually is is a better analogy for right. this whole thing. So so the one tip I, I would like to extend to you from uh okay friend of ours on the show, Breeze Grigas, okay. is that uh, when you launch your Kickstarter, don't have notifications sent to you for every comment and uh, <laughs> for like every comment made on your Kickstarter page or every pledge made. Don't have those sent to like your email or sure. your phone, for instance. Because sure. um, you'll have nonstop notifications if your game is a hit <laughs> right i mean so i you know i've backed a, a number of games that have been pretty successful like seventh continent role player gloomhaven one deck dungeon whatever and if you click on any one of those and go to the comment section they're generally in the like tens of thousands like kind of range ten thousand kind of range i couldn't imagine having that many emails in a month like yeah just, i think yeah, <laughs> we were talking to Breeze. He's like, "Yeah, no, I, I had notifications turned on," and he's like, "Don't do that. that that's no." Yeah. <laughs> mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's... thanks for the great advice. Yeah. <laughs> Why is my phone exploding? It's two in the morning. Ah. Yeah. <laughs> Damn you, time zones! <laughs> you destroyed everything again. You blew it up. You monsters. Um. <laughs> yeah, I I'm trying to think. We've I feel like we've learned a lot about Kickstarter over the years, Alex. Can you think of anything else that actually might be useful for for Jonathan? Uh, I feel aside like... from not having notifications turned on like that. Mm. I was trying to think of that too because I I I feel like we've learned things, and then it comes down to like being able to actually utilize that knowledge for good. And I don't know if I have anything. You just don't know if you can do any good. Yeah, do you have um, any knowledge I could use for evil? I mean, I might not use it, but I'd like to. Oh! Um, <laughs> yeah, I, I, I never actually send it out. That's, that's, the, evil, <laughs> that's the evil part. <laughs> no, yeah. people do not like that. Um, uh, oh, yeah, uh, the one that I hear a lot is, is have a realistic timetable of when you can actually deliver the game. Sure, definitely. That is um, a useful one. I mean, I, I can think of, you know, 10 without even looking mm-hmm. games that said they're going to promise this date and that date comes and goes and you don't see it for a year. Yeah. 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 It's never fun. <laughs> it's never Especially fun. Especially not on the receiving end. No, you get a lot of feedback on that. Not good feedback. Oh, no, right. no. Yeah. yeah. I mean, one thing. Oh, go ahead. Uh, one thing that I will say, though, is. Of the games that missed their goal, you know, I mean, that, not their goal, missed their deadline, and you know, I was still happy with. It's because the creators were always communicating what was going on, why they're having issues, what the delay was, and so that's one thing that I'm definitely going to try and do with this Kickstarter is always communicate and explain why we're having problems and what I'm doing to fix it. Yeah, communication is definitely a good thing to have, uh, especially in this medium. Um, 
I asked you what you had learned from games that might not have been successful, but I actually want to take the opposite question uh, while I have it in my head. Uh, what would you say is the best run Kickstarter that you have backed? Oh, man. Uh, let's see. I'm going to have to look this one up just to make sure I don't miss one. If that's all right. That's fine. Okay. Um, so best run project? Right. Like just um, o- overall, like the one that seemed like they knew what they were doing. It was obviously well done. And sure. uh, and and you felt like you were completely the most satisfied you could possibly be with it. Got it. Um, so I would say I, I have two answers. Um, the first one I'll say would be Brass. It was a Kickstarter just a couple months ago. Um, it's Roxley Games. They're doing a, a redesign for uh, Brass um, Lancashire. And essentially, they have been especially good at communicating. They have bent to, you know, quote unquote, demands of people who back their game. Like, you know, they've gone above and beyond as far as good customer service, listening to their backers, you know, and so far it looks like they're going to be, you know, dead on as far as their, their promised delivery date. So I would say that that's one that, you know, has done everything right. Um, the other one I would say would be Seventh Continent. It was a game two years ago by Sirius Pult. Um, really cool game. You should look into it. But they severely undershot when the game would be available, when when they would be done. But the interesting thing was, because they were communicating as well as they had been, um, they were you know sending out updates every three weeks. It was pretty much like clockwork. And whether it was, hey, this thing didn't work, we're working on it, we promise we'll get it in time, like, you know, this is the new deadline. Like, they just kept updating their backers. And by the time the Kickstarter came around, I didn't even realize that they were delayed, hmm. that just because they had been communicating so well, I didn't realize they literally delivered a year late, but I didn't even mind just because of how well they were communicating. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's, that's good to know. And a good shout out to those two projects, wherever you are. Yeah. Big ups. <laughs> I will pour yeah. a 40, I will pour a 40 out for you as well as Arthas. That's all that's important. Ooh. Who was the Lich King, Alex? I don't know if you were aware. Yeah, yeah, thanks. And and you said that he died, and I feel kind of bad, but also feel like that's apt. I mean, he died twice. Well, he had to die to become the Lich King. Exactly. You yeah. Be a lich if you're still alive. Me. <laughs> then you're just then you're just alive, Nathan. Anywho, um, <laughs> thanks thanks for explaining to me how the undead work, Alex. You're welcome. I knew you were having troubles with that. Yeah, I am. I, I, I can't raise my army of the dead now because I don't know how the undead work. You just wake that. them up from their sleep, Nathan. Uh, yeah, because winter is coming. Um, it, Winter's here. Sorry, winter is actually here. But you don't watch Game of Thrones, so you don't know what I'm talking about. Wait, winter is my <coughs> daughter's name, so I mean winter is here. Oh, okay, that's... That's that's strangely uh, accurate, then. Yeah, but, yeah, there you go. Yeah, that's <laughs> good. Um, but we have a guest, so I'm going to stop talking to you. Um, <laughs> so, uh, All good. Don't worry. It, it, yeah, don't don't worry. We uh, we try not to communicate with each other, but it, it's inevitable. Um, now, now, Jonathan, uh, from what I hear, and this is this is me hearing things, is uh. You've been doing, uh, and I think I probably heard this from you, so I, I don't think I'm saying anything, um, is that you do like a, a Kickstarter roundup where you're looking at all of these projects. Um, why did you want to start doing that? Uh, well, I mean, uh, when I was first following Kickstarter, I you know would go on every couple of days, and I would just look at all the games kind of obsessively, and my wife kind of got mad at me just saying like, John, put away your phone. Look at me. Like we hang out with us. Like we're doing this thing. And I'm just like, Oh, ah, okay. Um, so I ended up changing instead of looking every couple days, I just look now I just look once a week and it would take a really long time. And I realized that I was seeing the same projects 
over and over again because in general a popular project will continue being popular and that's generally how kickstarter does their metrics is they put the most popular ones on top so what i started to do instead because i wanted to see a, a wide range both successes and failures is i started looking at the recent uh, sorry soon to be ended projects so i once a week every saturday i go on and i look at the projects that are going to end in the next 10 days um and i go through and i find all the ones that are funded you know that look appealing from their project image or their little blurb and i do some research into them and i you know find the ones that um i think are doing the right stuff i take notes and then i um, if it's doing particularly well, I'll back it. Um, so I've been doing that now for you know two and a half years, looking at these you know almost ended projects. Um, what's the actual term for that? Sorry, um, but close yeah, to, so I've been close to completion. Yeah, close to completion. Um, I've been doing that for about two years now, and it's actually really been helpful because I see every project, every game that goes through Kickstarter. Um, yeah, sorted by end date. Um, that's the way that they phrase it. Um, but I've seen every Kickstarter that's come through for the last two and a half years. Um, and it's been really cool just being able to see that wide range of successful, unsuccessful, and, you know, try and answer to myself what they could have done better. And that's kind of helped me prepare for running my own Kickstarter. I get you. I get so you. You've also probably seen a bunch of games that have been on there that we've talked to the creators of on the show. Uh, yeah, I probably have. Um, like uh, Dragon Quest Trilogy Edition. Sure. Uh, Aegis. Vast. Yeah, definitely. Uh, Vast the Crystal Vast, Caverns. Yep. Uh, yeah, I've, I've, if it's come out in the last two and a half years, I've seen it on Kickstarter when it was live. So pretty much everything that's been on the show because we've been around for three years. <laughs> Pretty much. So there you go. Yeah. Uh, we just have a backlog on our website of Kickstarters you've already seen. <laughs> yeah, pretty much that's exactly. Yeah, Dell, the Kickstarters you've already seen. That's your <laughs> personal takeaway from the show. I'm going to our... change the tagline on the website right now. Yeah, stuff Jonathan already knows about <laughs> is the new tagline for Dellcast.com. <laughs> Delfcast.com, where uh, all your dreams have already come and gone. Thanks for coming. Um, <laughs> so, so on that note, though, you've been doing this for two and a half years now by yourself, right? And doing it for yourself, right? Which actually is a great segue into into uh, the same thing. <laughs> That's right. All of your hopes and dreams have come true. No, Alex, Ed, Al Alex, explain away. Um, so I found you because of you mentioning that you did this. Uh, right. Yeah. The other day on uh, one of the Facebook groups that I'm a part of, um, what was the exact question exactly? But someone was asking, like, what's you know, your how source do you, for you know, finding new Kickstarters and things like that? Finding new games uh, right. on that type of thing. Right. And I just answered, well, every week I just go through all the ending soon projects and you know, just find the ones that, you know, I've funded and look interesting. Right. And, that, and, I, right. and I had asked you if you did it for yourself or if you did it like and you made a list like written down. Right. And, you know, selfishly so far, I've only ever done it for myself. But we're hoping to change that. Exactly. Because um, hopefully uh, you have. Uh, probably reluctantly agreed to uh, do a write-up of what you do and post it on our website so other people can bask in the glory of not having to search through all the Kickstarters. <laughs> right. So, uh, <laughs> the, so starting after this podcast, uh, every Saturday when I go through and do my weekly Kickstarter delve, I... I'm going to actually write it up and I'm going to point out the Kickstarters that are ending in the next 10 days that, you know, look interesting, that are funded already, that, you know, what they're doing right, what, you know, some of them are doing poorly and just try and, you know, give a wide range of my experience as I look at all these Kickstarters. So if you just follow that, you'll see every Kickstarter that I think is interesting. 
that comes out for as long as I do this um, write up for. Now we're going to have to figure out a, something to call it. Yeah, something with Delve in the name would probably be right. Good. Right, we've got Delve Developer Diaries, Delvecast. That's right. It's okay. it's Delvetacular. Kickstarter Delve or something. Ah, maybe we should hold a contest on Twitter. Be like, come up with a name for this article series, and we'll give you a free article. <laughs> oh God, that's so scary. Um, because I know what we we're gonna get. <laughs> yeah, or we won't get anything good, and so it'll always be the unnamed write-up. Number one, number two, number three. <laughs> yeah, that, that will be, and it will be the most popular segment. <laughs> have you, do, does it have a name? No, it's it's that which shall not be named. You can't <laughs> say what it is. It's sure. the Voldemort of the of the uh, site. That'll be fun. That'll be sure. something fun to do. Um, yeah, no, and and that's really cool. And I can't imagine that we would take any kind of advantage of looking at that list ourselves for potential guests. Mm. Um, <laughs> not Can't at all. imagine. No. No, not at all. Uh, yeah, no, that's, uh, that's super exciting. Um, but, of course, what else is exciting is uh, Heirs of the Wizard King. Uh, and your goal, uh, I'm guessing this is because you had taken a cue from, from some other ones, is, is actually fairly low. It is. Um, so I went through and I found, you know, the best quality and yet still cheap manufacturer that I could. And I found some uh, good tricks as far as uh, shipping and fulfillment. And I'll talk more about those on the on the Kickstarter page. Um, but my goal is only thirty five hundred and that's going to cover a uh, thousand copies of the game and it's going to cover the shipping costs, you know, throughout the world. Um, you know, there'll be no added shipping costs um, after the project, um, which is quite reasonable when it comes to uh, a card game, a, a Kickstarter game. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Usually, it's in at least the five-digit area. So, right. so that's a, so you're you're down to four. That's right. just a, that just makes it all the easier. Do you right. feel like? Do you feel like? I think a lot of times when people are doing a Kickstarter, they do make the one critical mistake of they they aim really high instead of trying to go with the bare bones uh, mm. for a goal. Uh, in, in your experience, since you do look at this, you're you're a statistician's dream because you just you you've, you've looked at all of the data. Um, is is that really one of the big hurdles that most people have to overcome when they have a difficult time of it? Uh, it really is um, just where people are. Um, you, you can only charge as much as people are willing to pay. And if your goal is so high that you won't be able to reach it in time, you're not going to end up getting any money. So you, you can only really put a price on what you actually have to pay. So the printing costs, you know, that's a cost um, that you're going to have to pay. The shipping costs, art costs. You know, any graphic design, advertising, those are the things that you need to, you know, build your goal around. Um, because if, well, I really like this and I don't want to, you know, do my, my day job anymore. So I need to make at least 30000 in order to quit my day job. So that's what I'm going to put my goal at. When they're, <laughs> selling, when they're selling a deck of cards, I mean, that doesn't, it doesn't compute. So, right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Because I mean, it's it's it is the difference between uh, I get my thing launched or I or I don't in some right. ways. That's the that yeah. is the big thing. Uh, so Kickstarter is going to go for a little bit over a month. Uh, are you like your your loftiest goal? When in that process do you hit your goal? Um, I would love hitting the goal in the first day. Um, I have a yeah, pretty good. Yeah, so I mean, I've been working on my email list, you know, my subscribers and all that for a while now. Um, I have been doing these uh, Facebook posts, you know, every couple of days over the last couple of weeks. And I've been getting lots of likes and lots of, hey, this game looks amazing. Can't wait to back it. And so I feel like I might hit my goal in the first day. I mean, I'm a first time creator. Who really knows? But, right. you know, I would love to hit it in the first day. Um, maybe even the first couple hours, and then just be well on my way to stretch goals and that guaranteed, hey, I mean, it's already funded. 
I might as well back if it's only nineteen dollars. Right. You know, where can I go? Wrong? Yeah. No, that would be great. We we are we are pulling for you. And then when you do your roundup, you can say that. Uh, and if anybody else does something similar, they can see that you have indeed funded well before the Kickstarter has ended. And that yeah, would look exactly. good. Yeah, yeah it'll look great. Yeah. Um, the other thing that's nice is as I'm writing up these, you know, Kickstarter bills, um, I'll actually get to mention Heirs of the Wizard King twice on it because yes. it's going to be ending on a Thursday, which is, you know, uh, anyways, it, it works out. So, pretty nice. Yes. Yes. Self-promotion twice. Yes. Woohoo! Three, oh, three times, my friend. Three times. <laughs> three times. Yeah, I know. It's, 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 uh, oh, we're, uh, one more and we'll be able to fill out our players. We've had three mentions. That takes care of three colors. That's how the game works, right? It's it, 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 The players are mentions? No. Oh. I thought I almost knew how games work, Alex. I was wrong. I feel <laughs> bad. Yeah, Alex, you should feel bad. Well, Alex, if you have anything that you'd like to contribute, please be my <laughs> guest. <laughs> Because uh, obviously, obviously, I have run out of questions because now I'm talking uh, stupid talk, and that's usually my cue to let you have the floor. No, you can stupid talk all you want, Nate. Nope, <laughs> <laughs> not, not happening. I'm not doing it. Damn it! I usually have to stupid talk for at least half an hour. I'm trying to cut that way down. I was, uh, <laughs> we were recording a game last night, and I was like, I have to stay focused. I have to stay focused and not get into gobbledygook. They will be writing it down like, wait, what did he say? I don't know. I gotta be very careful about that now. Yeah. Except for that one yeah. little rant I just did. Good luck with that. <laughs> it's, it's terrific, everybody. You're gonna love it. Um, you uh, by by you, I mean Jonathan. Yeah. Uh, just while I'm on the Kickstarter page, you have three different pledge levels. Can you tell uh, me just right. a little bit about those? Um, sure. So the first one is just a uh, it's a one dollar pledge. By backing the one dollar pledge, you're showing support for the Kickstarter. You can also ask any questions, or you can you know comment in the comment section. And then every update that I um, that I put out, you'll receive. And in the end, it's only a dollar, um, but it's also a really big support for the game. Um, the second level is the main level. Um, it's nineteen dollars to receive a copy of Heirs of the Wizard King. Um, that covers shipping worldwide, um, and so the the game should, uh, assuming nothing really really bad, because I've put a pretty good buffer in there happens you'll get it by april of 2018 and then the last option is simply a, a bundle pack um, where you get six copies of the game um, and that's just the savings that i get from the shipping costs are just rolled into the pledge so that's 99 dollars. you get six copies of the game once again free worldwide shipping excellent so really you only need like 350 people or no you just need 35 people to basically pledge at that level, and you'll be there. Right, because the, the goal is 3500 so $3,500 backers, and I got it. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. So, so that's your goal, Alex. You got to be $3,500 uh, backers, and you'll be, able to, uh, you'll be able to make dreams come true. You, th you think yeah. you can find them? Alex um, is dumbfounded right now. You're asking me? Yeah. I want I want you to do the legwork, Alex. You know people. Make it happen. Um, no, <laughs> I'm not doing legwork. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know anybody. No, I'm kidding. Um, I'm I'm fairly certain it's not going to be too hard to find at least thirty five people to back it. <clears throat> don't know about that level, mate. But yeah, um, I mean, in general, the the hundred dollar level, the um, the bundle pack, that one's just for people who, you know, live far away and they want to save that little extra more when it comes to shipping. Um, in general, I imagine most of the backers will just be at that $19 level that you get one copy of the game. 
Mm. Um, however, I about halfway through, um, more likely than not, I will be unlocking or revealing uh, a second, or sorry, I guess a fourth pledge level, and that's going to be more for like a uh, deluxe version of the game with extra gameplay. But I'll mention that more on the, the, the Kickstarter update, so I don't want to go into sure. it now. Yeah, 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 absolutely. When you know more information, um, but you know the the Wizard King's Army ninety nine dollar pledge level though is also probably pretty good if you have a game store. Would imagine. Uh, yeah, sure. Um, and for that matter, uh, if you are going through the the page and you are a distributor or a retailer, um, well, you can't see it now, but you'll see it tomorrow when it goes live. Um, but anyways, the any retailers or distributors, just contact me, you know, for details, both for um, special deals that I may have for you kind of thing. Sure. Um, and uh, so are are you planning on eventually being able to get it into like brick and mortar stores? Uh, yeah, that's that's the hope. I mean, I feel like that's the hope for all Kickstarters is getting into stores, you know, be them brick and mortar or online. Um, just because there's only so far that I can reach by myself. Hmm. Whereas if I get it into stores or into distributors that then have stores, um, it'll reach a lot more people. And, you know, yeah, it'll, yeah. It, yeah. And that's really the hope of any Kickstarter project. Yeah. You think that that's like a in general, like for a, for a tabletop designer of any ilk to be able to see your game alongside, you know, Scrabble. And huh. Monopoly is like a, is like a huge win, like the the win you've made it, you've I reached the mountaintop. Of, I think you're thinking of the wrong games you want yours next to. Yeah. <laughs> what yeah, games say, do I want it next to? I want it next. To... Like Catan. Yeah, Catan, Splendor, Ticket to Ride. You know, more of the gamers game. You know, kind of games. <laughs> But if it was next to a Scrabble, that would be pretty awesome, right? Sure. <laughs> I mean, yeah. I, I, I think to your I think to your point, you're trying to say that you know if it was as well known as right, you know, Monopoly or Scrabble, and that's the point you're trying to make. Sure. Yeah, exactly. See, Alex, shut up. So. <laughs> Uh, Jonathan, was there uh, anything that we've we've uh, missed that maybe I'm I'm just not thinking of the question for uh, about the Kickstarter coming up that you wanted to mention? Um, I don't think so. Just once again, we'll be launching September fifth. You know, probably about nine a.m. Be running for a little bit more than a month. Um, you know, just I will be having both a print and play and a Tabletopia option where people can try out the game before they back um the, the rules are up on the page so there's really no reason not to do research into the game to see if it's a fit for you and you know your gaming friends yeah okay awesome uh well in that case without further ado i will try to do an outro which is that thing that i always end up doing at the end of the show remember how i used to try to do outros like really successfully alex yeah and fail Every single time. Yeah, pr pretty much. But I'm going to try to do it now because uh, I'm a professional, damn it. That's actually sure. my new mantra. I'm a professional, <laughs> damn it. Yeah. That'd be a good shirt or bumper sticker. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I'm, uh, <laughs> it's uh, damn it, Jim. Uh, I'm a doctor, not a machine. Uh, and uh, next to that is I'm a professional, damn it. Um, so. Or, or God damn it, I'm a professional. Bones, damn it! I'm a professional. <laughs> God, God damn it! I'm a professional. No bones, because because Doctor Do no, Bones on no. Star Trek. <clears throat> bones, damn it! Damn it, Bones! I'm a I'm a captain, not a machine. That's how that went. Pretty so sure. You're a, you're a professional right now, right? Oh yeah, that's why I'm doing this. Uh yeah, no, I'll actually do an outro like I'm pretending to to a podcast. That'll be fun. And then we'll plug everything again because plugging is like, but uh, it's plugs. Plugging is all about plugs. Um, that's that's the most profound thing I've said on the show. Uh, uh, okay, outro time. <clears throat> Alex, uh, how uh, long does it take you to kickstart your heart? Oh, jeez. 
Nathan, no. Nathan, no. Alex, uh, do I need to kick you in order to get you out of bed? You know, it would help. <coughs> yeah. Uh, <coughs> Sorry, I ran out of water. Sure, I'll blame it on that. Um, never mind. I've given up on the outro. So, if uh, folks out there would be interested in uh, finding out more about Delve, where could they go? <clears throat> when I'm not dying? Excuse yes, me? preferably once you're not dying. If people were interested in finding out more about Delve, where could they go? If you'd like to find out more about Delve, you can go to delvecast.com. And when you go there, you can find all sorts of things. Uh, you can find our uh, episodes and our articles. And uh, in the very near future, you might see something about Kickstarter roundups because of our happy guest. Uh, Jonathan, uh, where can they find information about the Kickstarter? Uh, Heirs of the Wizard King? Yes. Got it. Uh, so you can find more information about Heirs of the Wizard King, obviously, on Kickstarter. Um, you can also find more information on Board Game Geek. I have a page there. Or Facebook, there's the Heirs of the Wizard King uh, Facebook page. Excellent. Excellent. Uh, so stay tuned for that because it's coming right up. Uh, you can also find us on a few different places, actually pretty much anywhere where you would imagine you can find podcasts, including iTunes and Google Play. Just uh, please rate and review and subscribe while you are there, and then you'll get them as soon as the episodes drop. You can also find us on something called Twitter, and I'm at Citanium. I'm at EXP Limited. Our show is at Delve Podcast. Um, and, oh, Yes. Go ahead. Uh, I was just gonna say I don't. I think uh, Jonathan doesn't have a Twitter that he uses, as he mentioned. No. Oh. So, okay. So, so you can't plug his Twitter. Oh, All right. right. Wow. Wow. That's fine. One day, one day, I'll explain Twitter. I wish I could understand Twitter. I'm on it. I just don't know how it works. Unless you suddenly have a new Twitter that you want to plug. Yes. When when you have Twitter. You can plug it to your heart's content. I will let you do that. Um, if, uh, oh, what was I saying? Now I've, now I've gotten off my groove. I, I, I was like, oh, yeah, and then I'll swing, and then uh, the guest will talk, and then I'll talk. And that, that has all gone away, Alex. You're welcome. Thanks, thanks for ruining. I'm a professional, damn it. Thanks for ruining my mojo. <laughs> Um, all right. So, uh, I want to thank Jonathan Politis. I got that right this time, right? You did. Okay, there we go. I want to thank Jonathan Politis for, uh, coming on the show, talking to us about, uh, Heirs of the Wizard King, and, uh, and also for telling us how Kickstarter works, uh, and, uh, for being able to, uh, to lend your services, uh, to our little project. Happy to help. Yeah, that's a, it's a super cool, and uh, you can look forward to seeing that uh, in the very near future. Heirs of the yay! So excited, and uh, and heirs of the Wizard King. Uh, yeah, check it out uh, because uh, you know, once a, a king dies, you really have to. You know, it's it's a king of the hill scenario, right, uh, Alex? Um, you know, yeah. There's a power vacuum, and even more so if the king was a vacuum. Like a literal vacuum? Yeah, literal vacuum. Is the is that, uh, sorry. Is, is that your favorite type of king? A vacuum. The king? vacuum king. Oh, black holes are the, the vacuum king. The, uh, this that is true. So your favorite king is the black hole? Yeah, it's at the center of the galaxy. It's oh, massive. Okay, you might want to get your gargle blaster ready for that. That's fine. Yeah. I, absolutely. I guess that I feel like we just buried the lead. Is this a vacuum king in the game? Um, no. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we didn't bury the lead. Good. <laughs> we're, all, we're all set. Everything is accurate. I could I could dust my hands off and <laughs> and wash my hands of the whole thing. Uh, all right, uh, Jonathan. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Um, and uh, thank you all for listening. And uh, until next time, uh, we'll see you next time 
that could have gone better. Okay. <laughs> Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye. Bye.